Welcome to the Ayan Hirsi Ali podcast, a home for critical thinking and common sense. My guest today is Camille Foster. Camille is a journalist, serial entrepreneur, and partner at Freethink, a media company that publishes stories about social and technological innovations. Camille is also co-host of the podcast, The Fifth Column, where he and partners Matt Welch and Michael Moynihan banter about the past week's news and current events. While Camille is well known for many of his endeavors, one of his most notable journalistic accomplishments was his in-depth investigative reporting into the Central Park Karen incident. Camille is unmatched in his defense of free speech and individual liberty and unrivaled in his criticism of cancel culture wokeism. Before we turn to my conversation, I want to tell you about Stackmail. Free email services like Gmail and Yahoo aren't really free. You pay with your privacy. In fact, internet giants like Big Tech bank on exploiting your data by selling it to the highest bidder. Your business plan? Google has it. Your personal records? Yahoo could sell them to drug companies. That's why you should trust Startmail to secure your email. It'll make you feel safe again. I'm very concerned with security, not just physical security, but cybersecurity too. I know the importance of keeping your email secure and Startmail will do just that. Startmail keeps email private, period. Every email is encrypted, even if the recipient doesn't use encryption. When you delete an email in Startmail, it's gone forever. And Startmail uses their own servers, not Amazon's which means they can't be put out of business. Switching to Startmail is seamless too. You can easily transfer all of your current email data, so there's no starting from scratch. Startmail is also backed by the most stringent privacy laws in the world. You get unlimited anonymous aliases. This feature protects your main email address from spam and phishing attacks. So when you're giving your email to a company but want to protect your identity, Startmail can generate a shareable alias email so people can sell your information and they can be deleted anytime. I've looked into cybersecurity a lot and now is the time to secure your emails. Startmail is easy and gets the job done. Your privacy is valuable and should be protected. Your cybersecurity has never been more at risk. Email snoops and scammers are taking advantage of the pandemic as phishing has skyrocketed in the last year. Take control of your privacy with Startmail before it's too late. Start securing your email privacy with Startmail. Sign up today and you'll get 50% off your first year. Go to startmail.com slash IAM. That's startmail with a T, S-T-A-R-T, mail.com slash IAM for 50% off your first year. Startmail.com slash IAM. As the longest running magazine in the world, The Spectator believes that journalism must be witty as well as insightful, that ideas should be freely discussed without the constant threat of cancellation. The Spectator never confuses the serious with the dull. It isn't right wing or left wing. It believes in challenging, informing and entertaining readers. Since its founding in 1828, its mission has been to convey intelligence, not ideology. The Spectator believes that life is bigger than politics, which is why it also covers the arts and culture, food and wine, travel and life in all its facets. Sign up today, and as one of my listeners, you'll receive three free months of both the print and digital magazine, plus a free Spectator hat. To redeem this special offer just for listeners of this podcast, go to spectatorworld.com slash specialoffer and use offer code AYAN, A-Y-A-A-N, at checkout. Since I discovered it in 2009, I've loved The Spectator because it's dedicated to wit, strong reasoning, and brilliant writing. You're guaranteed to be entertained. 
The Spectator has published some of my favorite writers, including Douglas Murray, Charles Moore, Lionel Shriver, Christopher Caldwell, and the late Roger Scruton. From the Biden administration to book reviews, from cancel culture to cultural cuisine, The Spectator will entertain you from cover to cover. So sign up today to get three months of The Spectator for free, plus a free Spectator hat when you subscribe at spectatorworld.com slash special offer. Again, use offer code AYAN, A-Y-A-A-N, at checkout to redeem your offer. That's spectatorworld.com slash special offer and offer code AYAN, A-Y-A-A-N. Now to my conversation. Camille, thank you so much for talking to me. Um, I met you uh, about a month ago, maybe a month and a half ago when this podcast is dropped. Mm. Uh, But I will say to you, I was hugely impressed by who you are and what you represent for the future of our society. Well, that That's an enormous compliment. Thank you so much, Ian. I've been a a huge fan of yours for a very long time and have always uh, revered you for your bravery and integrity and fearlessness. Um, And uh, yeah, that's an enormous compliment coming from you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I have to say that is all mutual. (laughs) After spending um, um, some time with you at that conference, uh, we had in Old Parkland in Dallas. And this was in honor on the one hand of Thomas Sowell, but on the other hand, it was a a very serious and I think a thoughtful gathering of people who wanted to answer the question of what is the black future and what is it to be a free man and woman Mm -hmm. and be black in America. And so I'm simply going to start with just, uh, and, and think of this as a conversation. But I just want to get to know you better. And as you introduce yourself, uh, I hope that my listeners um, get to meet someone, uh, a a young Black man who grew up in America and who thinks that America is, in fact, the best country to live in. And for, for, for us to kind of get all sides of that perspective and how you came to that perspective. Share with me a little bit about your family life. Where were you born? What was your household like? What kind of school did you go to? Uh, What was the neighborhood like? Sure, sure. Um, Well, I am a first generation American. My family is from Jamaica, uh, my my biological father and my mom. Um, And I I use biological father because he he was not present in my life. Um, I had a a stepfather who happened to be born in the United States and was a bit older than my mom. uh, So he'd had uh, some very distinct life experiences. um, And I was able to benefit from all of that, which I perhaps get into a little later. But um, we grew up in and around D.C., Maryland, Virginia. Um, growing up, I had a very acute sense of my kind of Jamaicanness in the context of my Americanness. Uh, my family would frequently kind of talk about us and them and other people, and it was never obvious when they were referring to others if they meant Americans in general or white people in particular or black people. Um, so there's a sense in which. Um, I, I always had this this kind of very, I was outside of the kind of conventional American binary, which I wonder mm-hmm. if that's something that you can relate to, um, where you know you're you're raced and you're told that you're black and there are very particular expectations for you as a black person in America. Um, but I had to deal with you know the expectations of me as uh, as a as my my father's son and my mother's son uh, first and foremost, which was kind of a, a Jamaican thing, but my, my stepdad, um, who I only ever referred to as dad, so I'm only saying that for the purposes of being clear here, um, was, I think, kind of instinctually like an individualist uh, and would constantly talk to me about my duty to myself, like my responsibility for, for being a leader, not so much in the sense that I'm kind of cultivating a following, but that I'm beating out my own path and I'm not kind of following anyone else that I had a responsibility to kind of define my own 
altitude <laughs> um, by, by, with respect to my own attitude uh, in terms of the way that I kind of dealt with different um, tensions that I might encounter in life. So, you know, I went to public schools. I think I had uh, what in many respects was a kind of conventional middle class, perhaps even lower middle class upbringing, which is probably something I'm kind of wrestling with as I think about it now, because we went through some kind of tumultuous economic circumstances. Um, as a, a young man in elementary school, at one point, my family lost their home, uh, and we had to go live with my grandmother for a little while. Um, and uh, I'd say that, you know, I, I had a very large Jamaican family, um, and was after the, the period of time where we kind of moved to Maryland to live with my grandmother and then kind of got back on our feet again, I was always around, you know, aunts, uncles, cousins. We would have these massive uh, dinners on the weekends uh, after our, our, after church. We grew up a uh, Seventh-day Adventist and it, it never dawned on me that this wasn't something that everyone did. Like get together with 60 or 70 people who are either your, you know, aunt, uncle, first cousin for the most part, um, or a second cousin, and that you had kind of this intimate connection with a big community of people. Um, and there's a very real sense in which I think I was able to kind of find a, a sense of myself uh, outside of the, the kind of binaries that are offered by society more broadly. Um, and I'd say that that all is really fundamental to the kind of person that I had ended up becoming. So a few things uh, as you speak a few thoughts that come up in my mind. One is, and I've been talking to um, a number of Black Americans, or at least I thought they were Black Americans, until uh -huh. they say, you know, I'm first generation, my family came from Jamaica. Uh -huh. And so from this, I'm assuming it's, is it, a, you know, a Black community within a Black community? Uh, by the way, Another striking thing about Jamaicans is that they're quite successful mm -hmm. uh, and prominent in America. Another emerging group of successful people I see in America are Nigerians, for instance. Mm -hmm. So when you describe this, you know, we had this big family and we were together and uncles and aunts. And is that something that the Black Americans, the African Americans uh, who are, you know, from you were growing up in Maryland, who, who were growing up there, and who's uh, who live there, and who call that place their home. Is that something they lacked? You know, I I don't know if I can say that in general they lacked it. I I will say that I think as an adult now looking back on it, it seems pretty obvious to me that it was it was decidedly unique as compared to kind of most people's experience. Um, yeah. One, I think growing up in a family that large, I mean, my grandmother and grandfather had had nine kids um, and no one had fewer than two, two children. And some of them had many more than that. So there was a lot of us. Um, and in both cases, they were also kind of one of many. Uh, and, and so it, this having of children, whether it's two children or nine mm -hmm. children, uh, these, uh, children out of wedlock, were there marriages first and then children for the, or? For the most part, there were marriages first. Um, I was an exception uh, in that my, my mother, uh, the, my biological father was a, a, a serial philanderer, I think is the, the kindest way I can put it while being very honest mm -hmm. uh, in that my mom was unbeknownst to her, his second mistress. Uh, right. So I have siblings that um, I don't know particularly well, but who are, you know, 13 months older than me in certain instances yeah. as a result of this. Um, so, you know, my situation was somewhat unique in that respect, but uh, for the most part, I think my, uh, my first cousins, you know, they were like functional and from as best as I could tell, um, although, you know, nothing superhuman about it, like functional mm -hmm happy homes, good marriages. Um, but, and the presence of fathers, there were male yes. figures that- Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I had one. I mean, my, my your, stepfather, your stepfather, yeah, I never, from the time I was about two and a half, three, he was in my life and I, I only ever called him dad while he was alive and I never had to think about it. And I can distinctly remember meeting my, my biological father on one of the three or four times that I met him while he was alive and him asking, do you know who I am? And me referring to him as my stepfather. So yeah, you're my stepdad. In my mind as a child, I thought, oh, the stepdad is the guy who like leaves. And the dad <laughs> is the guy who stays. Um, he didn't like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. 
Um, I think that these are some very important, and in some ways they've become controversial to say that maybe <laughs> boys, little boys, when they're growing up uh, and their identity is developing, um, they need that father figure to look up to who's looking after them, whether that's a biological father or a stepfather or, I don't know, a church leader or... Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the, as you remember that conference, uh, the big conversations that were going on was when these men, uh, the biological fathers, no longer take responsibility for their families, the families disintegrate. Mm. Not every family disintegrates. Mm -hmm. Not every household that's led by a single mother disintegrates. They have difficulties. But a lot of them do, mm -hmm. to the point where I think it is, we should simply be honest and say, that is not a model for establishing a family. Yeah. I mean, what would as, you say to that? Yeah. I mean, as a, as a somewhat new father still, um, I have a four-year-old daughter and I have a son who is about 16 weeks now. And um, at a minimum, when you have to divide the work between two, when you can divide the work between two people versus one, that's I think pretty important. And having had the distinct experience of growing up as a boy, um, I can say that there were things that I had to learn from from my dad um, that my mother would encourage me to kind of talk to my dad about or, or from my pastor, who was also like really uh, influential um, in my life. And I was like fortunate to have him. I had a few, but there's one in particular, Pastor Stoddard, who was just really um, who poured a lot into me and spent time with me and, and helped me. And it did the sort of thing that, that it seems a little cliche, but is just so. Like I can still imagine the day when he took me in the backyard and like taught me to chop wood and yeah. was just kind of talking to me about life and about the things I aspired to do. Um, and it was one of the people who, because I had children kind of late in life, who encouraged me to have children because he knew that it was um, something important to do, which a person in my position who, you know, had had a little bit of success was perhaps not prioritizing. Um, and he was, he was right on, on most accounts. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that there's something distinct that boys need. Um, and that's not to say that you can't get it in a single parent household. Um, mm -hmm. It's not to say that you can't get it if you have an unconventional um, household and say you have two mothers or something like that. Um, but I do think that there are kind of unique needs that, that a lot of boys have. And it, it kind of bears out in, in the data. Um, when you look at things like the Darwin Awards, um, like men's uh, mortality rates or young men's mortality rates versus young ladies, like there are distinct differences there. Yeah. Um, and one might you know, chalk that up to something like uh, uh, toxic masculinity or something, but whatever you chalk it up to, the difference is material um, and has real consequences. And so when we are in these conferences, in these gatherings, and we're talking about, my goodness, how do we uh, close the gaps in disparity between the Black community and others? And at this point, others isn't, isn't it's just not Black communities or white communities, it's mm -hmm. Black communities and newly arrived Nigerians and Chinese and Indians and Jamaicans, uh, the uh, sort of original African-American communities, they are lagging behind from everyone else. And so if you want to close those disparities, you are saying we should be having some of these conversations that have been made uh, taboo or controversial by organizations like Black Lives Matter about, let's talk about the family, Black family, which is the first institution that you're born into as a baby. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, for me, I've been in a, in a time where we talk a great deal about disparities um, and specifically, you know, racial disparities. Uh, I'm someone who's nearly always inclined to think more globally and to think specifically about the fact that there is kind of some deprivation that needs to be addressed and who believes pretty, pretty stridently <laughs> um, that the most important thing that we can think about is probably not so much how we arrest disparities between groups, but how we arrest um, kind of this, this systemic, systematic, uh, to use some words that are pretty freighted, um, kind of patterns of deprivation and lack that impair kids of all backgrounds across a bunch of different spectrums because the things that are helpful in helping schools be better at teaching kids to do math or read um, or to, to be successful in the sciences, they tend to be racially agnostic. 
And I think that there is a, a real risk of being, you know, so caught up in thinking about the disparities that we don't get around to forging really good policy um, and really good strategies for just helping children succeed in general. Um, and I think that that is of, of really profound importance and the same, you know, lack that may exist with respect to, you know, family structures, the fact that, you know, children are perhaps spending too much time watching television versus reading things that we actually know have an impact on their, their potential outcomes in life. Um, I, I think that that, that could be a, a real problem. So, you know, keeping, keeping the main thing, the main thing, focusing on outcomes more broadly um, is, is always my, my preference uh, and, and a point of emphasis for me in these discussions. And is that because you became a classical liberal? <laughs> you, <laughs> uh, take me from, you know, when you left elementary school and your voyage through high school and university and mm -hmm. the way your worldview was shaped um, by those experiences. Yeah, well, I'll say that at some point along the way, I think I became a kind of conventional, perhaps even de facto Democrat in the sense that going into university, my perspective on politics was that, you know, Democrats were good and Republicans were, were bad and would do anything, you know, short of sucking the marrow from baby's bones, given the opportunity. I just was kind of conditioned in that way and hadn't thought in a very sophisticated way about politics. Um, I had had some opportunity to think about government broadly and was always acu acutely interested in how government worked and what it was for. Um, but again, I, I think I had pretty conventional ideas about that as well, or at least ideas that I hadn't in, interrogated. Um, you know, at, at the time, I would have said that, you know, the Kennedy speech, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, um, was probably that along with, you know, Martin Luther King's I Had a Dream. Like those were, those were kind of the touchstones for me. Um, and it is still the case today that Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech is really important to me personally. But some point in college, I got a hold of Milton Friedman's book, Capitalism and Freedom. And that was a really transformative experience for me. Uh, and there's a section in there in the introduction, I believe, where Milton talks about two things. One, he talks about that Kennedy speech and says that, that neither aspect of Kennedy's kind of famous uh, quote, ask what you can do for your country or ask what your country can do for you, that neither aspect of that were consistent with the ideals of a free man and a free society, that what we ought to be focusing on is what we can do together to kind of build a, a system that allows us all to pursue our several aims. And that was really profound. Um, but Milton also painted a picture for me um, of, of a broader kind of conception of human freedom and made it very clear that, you know, throughout most of history, most people have been subjugated. And I think that there was something that I, I perhaps had been taught, but that had never really been explicitly stated to me. Um, and that those two kind of ideas, those two kernels um, would be and continue to be like really uh, important for me and uh, would be the things that have kind of animate my interest and concerns in the world of kind of political philosophy and even political activism today. In terms of so that evolution, you know, from, okay, identifying as a Democrat, mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Uh, sure. Why, uh, you know, why did you think one way about Democrats and a different way from Republicans when, how did that, I, yeah, how did these ideas get into your head? It's hard to say. I mean, I think there's just a kind of social conditioning that, that took place in my household. Again, it just wasn't something that I interrogated very rigorously. I didn't develop a set of sophisticated ideas about politics. I think I had of a child's naivete in some respects, even, even at that advanced age, being someone who's at university where I thought, you know, well, people need things and government is there to give people things. And that, that's a good thing. Uh, but there's a sense in which that was never fully compatible with my values. I, I probably always had certain expectations about the importance of kind of earning something versus having it given to you, but hadn't really been forced to kind of reconcile those perspectives. Um, and I think being exposed to those particular ideas in the very crisp way someone like Milton Friedman would dis, dis, uh, disseminate them 
was was very helpful. It also probably helped that I became uh, an economics major. I was actually a government and economics double major at University of Maryland. And as a result, I was exposed to a lot of economic thinking um, and a lot of basic kind of economic frameworks like comparative advantage um, and uh, institutions like the World Trade Organization, which for all of its defects is an organization that an institution that really tries to promote trade and free trade broadly. Um, and the advantages of these systems, the way in which these ideas uh, kind of work to advance human progress and improve the quality of human lives, um, to allow us to, to build sophisticated systems in a really complicated world um, was something that just became increasingly apparent to me. And as someone who now has come to really value kind of human progress and thriving um, and prosperity in general as uh, an essential value, um, it's hard to to not be be really committed to advocating for those those same ideals in a bunch of different contexts. It looks like you couldn't make up your mind about whether to be a journalist or an entrepreneur or, <laughs> or start a think tank. <laughs> yeah, um, that's, you doing that's probably a little bit the case. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's funny. I, I um. You know, my first my first gig um, in it actually began when I was in college. I started a telecom consulting firm while I was in my second year of undergrad, and it was sufficiently successful that I found myself very quickly like only being able to go to one or two classes per semester, uh, and while we were building this business. Uh, but I also, even while I'd moved out of my mother's house and had bought a place of my own. Um, was in a position where I knew my mother would be exceedingly disappointed in me if I didn't finish uh, my degree. So eventually I just kept going while building this company. Um, so that was kind of my first foray into entre entrepreneurship. And I really, I would say, probably fell into it in the sense that I, I just got lucky. I had someone who um, I knew who was working in an industry um, and who needed the particular skills that I had um, and had an opportunity to build something cool. And it became a lifestyle business and, and, you know, help me uh, have a bunch of opportunities that I probably wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, but it also gave me the confidence to build other things. And as a result, I've been fortunate to kind of find myself in different spaces, um, oftentimes finding, finding things that didn't exist that I thought ought to exist. <laughs> and uh, not even thinking twice about the possibility of you know, well, do we just go on in this world where it doesn't exist? Do we hope someone else builds it or do we just get to work? Um, and just getting to work is just, it's just kind of my disposition at this point. And at this time, when you have these ideas and you just, you want to run away with them and you're missing classes for them, you're so passionate about it. Did you, <laughs> like, did you ever feel uh, there was, you were uh, stopped from, doing what you wanted to do, achieve what you wanted to achieve because of your skin color? No, no. I'd, I'd say that in general, I've, I've, I think, again, in large part, perhaps because of the influence of my dad, um, I'd always been taught that I had the capacity to do just about anything I put my mind to, and that the responsibility for achieving those goals was primarily on me, whatever obstacles I might be facing. Um, so I'd, I'd say that I was conditioned to believe that and that, you know, whatever other kind of dispositional uh, belief that someone might have that they're being, you know, discriminated against, they're somehow obstructed in the pursuit of their, their passions um, is just something that I've, I've never been, exp I've never really had the, the opportunity to adopt, um, or at least, you know, I've been fortunate to be uh, spared uh, being indoctrinated into, uh, into that sort of belief. And, and I use that word um, mm -hmm. advisedly because I see so many people who have this, this belief that there is kind of this fundamental obstacle to their ability to succeed in life and who can believe that, you know, when they, when they go say to this, to shop at the mall, that when they walk into the store, if someone greets them at the front of the store, then that's because they're watching them and they're surveilling them. Mm -hmm. um, and when they go to the store and no one greets them at the store, well, that's because they assume they don't have any money in their pocket. And I'm free to yeah. imagine that when I walk to the store and someone says, can I help you? They, they just want to help me. 
Um, and <laughs> to the yeah. extent they haven't talked to me, they, maybe they're busy or they're having a bad day, but I don't presume the worst. Yeah. And as a result, that, that kind of hobgoblin isn't haunting my every thought or impeding my ability to, to sort of think about what my responsibilities are in any given circumstance or what I can do to improve my chances of success in any given circumstance. Okay, what about the following statements? Mm -hmm. um, I applied for a loan, but because I'm a black man, I was declined, that was declined. And I applied again and I did it several times in different banks in different states. Mm -hmm. And I'm declined that loan uh, or uh, I write a business proposal and uh, I submit it and I get criticism after criticism and, and then the whole thing doesn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, there are uh, clubs and sort of exclusive clubs, places that I'm supposed to come to. I feel uneasy, but I have to go. And, you know, I didn't open my mouth. So is it, wasn't I welcomed or was I excluded right. because I'm black? I mean, when you hear these stories from men your age who all who are just as driven, mm -hmm. just as ambitious, but who are saying like around the system around them, is just it, it excludes them, right? Beyond, yeah, beyond you know what you described, which is yeah, which is very mm -hmm. difficult. It's so subjective. It's difficult to measure. Yeah, to if someone greets you and how you read into that, it's very difficult to have sort of an objective look. But if you've tried over and over again to get these loans and you don't get it, and it even goes so far as to say someone with an inferior business plan will walk into a bank and only because he's white, he gets the loan. Sure. So these sure. are material things. These are objective things. What, what yeah. would you say to that? Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I certainly believe that racism exists um, and that it is entirely possible that someone could, could receive or be the recipient of mistreatment on the basis of their immutable characteristics. Certainly the case. Um, there are contexts in which one can't know whether or not it is true that they were discriminated against. Right. And in those contexts, like the one I was describing a moment ago, um, I have the advantage of not being particularly haunted by the specter yes. <laughs> of yes. discrimination. Um, but then there are going to be circumstances where you are you know, openly discriminated against, where someone expresses some kind of hostility towards you and there's, it's unambiguous and you know yeah. that it's because of your race. Um, and you know, to the extent I've had anything like that happen to me, and I'll say that I've probably had that sort of thing happen both with respect to, you know, white people who have particular expectations of me and people who are, who, who are, and I'm, I'm using this, I do air quotes, like also black, yeah. um, <laughs> who have expectations that I don't satisfy and who are, you know, disappointed or angry or upset with me or something like that. Interestingly, the fact that I don't have this kind of disposition where I'm always looking for that sort of bigotry in general, um, I'm, I'm fortunate to live at a time where there just isn't that much racism. Of it, um, yeah. And to the extent I've encountered it, it's usually people who aren't in a position to do anything to harm me. Like they're, these are people who are generally in a kind of lower station in life. The, the reality of America in 2022 is that to the extent people harbor kind of actively malevolently racist ideas, um, they're generally people who who need help more than I do. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. like their, their lives are in dire straits to the extent yeah. that those kind of malignant ideas are, are kind of popular and common. Like that's, that's to their disadvantage. Um, and I'm, I'm probably filled with more kind of sympathy than resentment for those that's people. I wish I could, I wish I could help them. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel much the same way about, you know, anyone who is, is kind of haunted by the specter of discrimination and who imagines that they know, they just know why their mm -hmm. bank loan was dis, dis, uh, dis not qualified, um, you know, or, or was uh, uh, not given the mortgage. a loan. Yeah. yeah. Uh, both Milton Friedman and Shelby Steele mm -hmm. uh, actually do say, uh, they talk uh, exactly the way you talked, where, you know, then you move on and, and apply for the next station and those who refuse to give loans or who refuse to give you their business, uh, they, they're not hurting you as much as they think they're hurting you. They're hurting mm -hmm. themselves and their own businesses. And you have, uh, fortunately, what you say you got from your father and 
your community where they've given you that confidence as an individual um, that you don't get derailed by it, that it doesn't lower your self-esteem. It mm-hmm. doesn't get to you. You just move on. Yeah. And, it's, it's a lot like any other hardship. And, you know, as someone who's been in business for themselves or even just lived a life, you, you find hardships almost anywhere and you can find them for all manner of unfair reasons. Um, and the only question becomes, how do you respond to this hardship? And there's generally no advantage in complaining. <laughs> yes. <So. laughs> um, that's absolutely true. And so on that, you are also um, um, an activist in the sense that you want to try and help others, in particular, young black men, and how to avoid this subjective, uh, these subjective beliefs where they're in their way. Everyone else is telling them you're a victim of racism. There's nothing you can do to get out of, um, you know, the, the, this uh, hardship because everyone is against you. The system is against you. Um, and the system is against you for your skin color. The system was against your ancestors. It's never going, there's going to be no fair game. So you might as well give up. So then as a young black man, what do you do? You turn to, you turn inward and you get, you know, all the things that we now read about depression, anxiety, all the mental health challenges. Um, But there's also turning into crime and gangs and uh, the, uh, uh, let me call it the informal Wall Street of the inner city. Mm -hmm. Share with me, how do we understand this and how can we redirect that young man uh, and give him hope that, there is, uh, it's possible to thrive in America if you're a black, a black man, live in freedom um, and recognize these threats, recognize the attraction of the, of the gangs mm. and the fact that that's a dead end, uh, but also recognize these other organizations that are trying to turn you into a victim who can do nothing and just drive you also into the nihilism of mental health. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think it's fair to say that I have a I have a particular interest in race and perhaps a a, a very in, well informed perspective on kind of the the sort of what what James Baldwin describes as kind of the gates of paranoia that that sort of paralyzing dynamic that takes place when you are constantly kind of surveilling the horizon for the next inevitable bout with racism. Um, but in truth, you know, to the extent I have concern for my fellow human, um, I, I would say that, that race probably doesn't really enter into the picture all that much. Um, my like, kind of advocacy and mentorship work to the extent I've been able to do that in life, and I've had some opportunities to do that, um, is really informed by my, my, ind- my sense of individualism. And I, I would say that I describe myself as a classical liberal and as a humanist and as an individualist. And part of being an individualist is, I think, in my estimation, a, a deep appreciation for the fact that dignity is something that one has to cultivate, like an appreciation for their own dignity, a respect for it, like honoring the fact that, you know, their their right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is on the basis of their humanity and that there is something um, very, very important that's worth safeguarding about the fact that, you know, you are here now and you have this distinct opportunity to, you know, pursue your own happiness in the circumstances that you find yourself in and having a, an appreciation for kind of what you are and a real, uh, a deep um, abiding sense of your own value and worth is invaluable. And I think having that in conjunction with appreciation and appreciation for where you find yourself now um, in this particular kind of region of the world, say the United States, and at this particular point in time in 2022, um, with all of the privileges, to, to use a word that is very freighted, but I think is very appropriate in this context, but with all the privileges that that entails, um, 
it, it puts you in a position to, I think, really have a, a, a sense that you, there's something that you ought to be fighting for. And there's something that you ought to really think about in terms of like being accountable to yourself um, for taking full advantage of the opportunity that's in front of you. And it doesn't mean that you don't have kind of unique challenges in life, but any other way of imagining yourself um, or thinking about yourself that is kind of at odds with those values um, is, is probably to your disadvantage and something that you ought to be finding a way to shelf. Um, in which case, you know, if you have that really deep and abiding sense of dignity and self-worth and about uh, the, the kind of opportunity that life has given you to be alive now, I think it becomes very hard to, to subjugate all of that to, you know, being a member of a gang or pursuing something because you think it's better for the, you know, racial tribe that you happen to be a part of. Uh, so, you know, I think that's perhaps the, the thing that I would most focus on, um, really cultivating a, a, a healthy sense of self-esteem and rooting that self-esteem, not in something uh, kind of facile um, or, or kind of crude, like race tribalism, um, but in something really enduring, um, like the, your own ignorant individual dignity and self-worth and cultivating that, accomplishing things that give you something that you can be meaningfully proud of. Um, so I think that's, that's probably the answer I'd give to that question. No, I think that's all profound, very, very profound. And um, that's making me uh, think I will stop talking to you about race and racial differences and challenges <laughs> to black people <laughs> and start talking to you about then what is it that ails our country as a society, maybe even our, uh, our civilization mm. where uh, it's the most advanced society in the world. Mm -hmm. People from all over the world want to come to America and other Western countries. Uh, I've never uh, been exposed to more freedom as a woman or equality. I mean, mm -hmm. compared to anywhere else, you will, I mean, head and shoulders uh, taller. Um, and then we have diversity of all kinds in terms of tolerance. I think at times we become extreme in what we call tolerance, which is a misunderstanding of tolerance. So, what is then, why are we um, so despondent with our country, nation, borders, with our civilization? Why are we taking it down constantly? This isn't limited to one race. It, it, it's, it's prevalent. There's a, there's a depression from within. Mm -hmm. um, I've read the works of now many conservatives who tell me as a classical liberal, all the whole problem is because of classical liberalism, <laughs> because hmm. it's anchored in nothing. There are no guardrails. It has, uh, it, it offers no um, answer to those young men who are seeking transcendence and spirituality. And so hmm. all these charlatans are starting uh, different religions and, and that's uh, there's just a crisis of identity there's a crisis of purpose uh, there's a crisis of leadership in America and all these things are true would you um, venture to comment on that yeah I mean it's it's an enormous it's an enormous problem and you know I'm, I'm sensitive to people who talk about the, the need for purpose and the degree to which having a deep and abiding faith in something uh, can, can kind of be a source of helping to give one that sense of purpose. But it also seems to me that there's a very real sense in which, um, and, and actually you've talked about this in your work as well, particularly in the context of Islam, but this is broadly applicable the need for a lot of those kind of traditional religious traditions to be moderated um, and to, to, to kind of reform themselves because of the, the kind of bright light uh, that is kind of the, the, the classical liberal 
values that we kind of derive from like enlightenment traditions, the, the things that help to give us the framework for the United States of America as a, as a country that really served as the, the kind of backbone to this project. Um, so I think that there's a very real sense in which a, a lot of people simply don't have uh, a real sense of kind of the historical context that we kind of arrive here, that we ought to arrive here with, that they have a very kind of pessimistic um, notion about what the United States is and what it represents, what the kind of most important things about it, historically speaking, are. I think it is, it's become very commonplace for people to say, in fact, I think it was like Gavin Newsom, uh, the, the governor of California, who in like the fall of 2020 talked about uh, slavery and its role in America and described America as this country where our past is one of slavery, racism, and injustice, and our systems were built to oppress people of color. Like that is the sensibility that he has about what America is at, in the most fundamental sense. Um, I call and, him Governor Nuisance. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, and he's our governor and you should yeah. see the kind of job he's doing. I, I've, just, I've just migrated out of California, so I'm somewhat, somewhat familiar. Uh, having only spent a little over a year there um, and loving the place for a lot of reasons, but not loving the way it was governed. Um, but I think that there's something like just aggressively ahistorical about that characterization of America. This, it doesn't appreciate like the dense catalog of inhumanity that humans have visited upon one another over the course of time. Um, and the fact that the American project really is kind of a departure from, you know, age old uh, systems and patterns of abuse and is part of this rather stark um, new paradigm where we start to regard people as individuals and we start to think carefully about what that ought to mean what their, their sense of kind of individualness, what their dignity as a human ought to entitle them to. And it's certainly true that the American project was hardly perfect, that it was deficient in many ways and excluded lots of people um, from being kind of fully represented and fully granted their, their due. Um, but there's a very real sense in which our ability to see those problems, those defects um, was owed in large part to the ideas that animated the American experiment, um, but also the American experiment itself. It gave rise to the global abolitionist movement. Um, like that, that seems really important. Um, there's a very real sense in which, you know, other places might have been the home for that. They might have helped to spur that, but they didn't. You know, the United States did. Um, Elijah Lovejoy, the transcendentalists, and I'm, I'm naming those people specifically um, for a particular reason, but like those people were Americans in the kind of most meaningful and enduring sense of the word. Um, and I think that there's, there's something really profound about that. And I, I, I suspect that if we were able to cultivate a deeper appreciation for that, it might uh, engender a, a better sense of like kind of confidence and faith in the project and a, a real, perhaps a greater willingness to do things, to preserve it and to continue perfecting it, uh, to borrow a, a phrase from the constitution. Yeah, and I think in addition to that, maybe reflect more deeply on uh, those individuals uh, that founded America and that shaped America. Um, those were men and women. Mm -hmm. And I think those identities, what is the American man? So if you're now, if, if you ask me now, can you describe who the American man is? Um, I can't. Mm -hmm. It is in 2022, um, there are so many different flavors of who a man is and who he is not and what's halfway between a man and a woman mm. um, that I think once you start, you get to a place where you can't define who a man is. I know a lot of us are preoccupied with the conflicts now about defining a woman and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. her biology and whether whatever um but if you take one step back what you're going to see is there really is a crisis in the description of who an american man is who is man um, and i hope that in a different podcast and in a different context i'd like you to think about it and i'm asking all my male friends to think about that 
Hmm. And we've done a lot of thinking about women and her rights and her place in society and where we've gone uh, off the rails there. And then we have all these uh, new groups uh, who are demanding their rights. But there is a confusion about uh, not just the biological, or this is a man and that's a woman. And every time when you ask this question, people tend to fall straight into, uh, you know, the biological concepts of it. But it is really more the, it, it's, it's not the biological, it's the cultural. Mm. Uh, how do you know the difference between um, an upper class man and a lower class man? You know, we talk about classes. Now, who do, how do we know about a man who is strong and an, a member of the elite? And what is the distinction from one who is not? Mm-hmm. What are the standards uh, so I guess it's time, uh, perhaps, that we started asking these questions. And I know there are more people asking it. And so it's not just a crisis of the Black family or a crisis of uh, leadership and institutions, etc. I think we're just going to have to revisit some of these identities and get some clarity on that. And what does classical liberalism have to say about that? Hmm. And what do conservatives have to say about that? And what is it about American history and American culture that at one time had these heroes, uh, almost superheroes? Hmm. Whereas now, if I ask you in 2022, name one man you admire, Hmm. you pause. Yeah. (laughs) And I've I've been doing that. I've been asking men of different ages, uh, in different backgrounds in 2022 to name a man, um, you know, they admire to the point of being almost superhuman. They can't. They'll hmm. say, I admire, I admire this guy for that. And I admire this guy for that. And I, but what is your, you know, ideal man? Hmm. And so I think this, maybe we have to take, all of these mini crises that we have and then take it to that identity of uh, who are we as an American? Who's the American man? Who's the American woman? What is she? What is he? What do you think of that? I think it's a a really profound and interesting question. Um, And I, I suspect it's the kind of question that can be like very easily become something that's polarizing in the sense that someone might hear it and think that there's something kind of essentialist about it in the sense that, you know, only a man can do or only a woman can do. Um, but I do think you're, you're highlighting something that's really important. Like we do spend a great deal of time thinking about kind of women and their roles uh, and the degree to which there are kind of unique obstacles for them to have to overcome um, and perhaps don't give the same kind of consideration to, to men in the context, in the same sort of context, um, and kind of a tendency to kind of talk about the patriarchy and the advantages enjoyed, yes. uh, enjoyed by, let's like, say, cisgender men in particular. But there is a very real sense in which, like, young men are subject to particular sort of travails that simply don't exist for young women, um, and that talking about the kind of distinctness of that experience you know, is not, is not a bad thing. It is, it's worthwhile to the extent that those lives are important to us. And we're going to have a sophisticated understanding of what's happening there. Um, And that we could do that in a careful way um, without, you know, insisting that there's a particular way to be a girl. Um, I'm reminded of the fact my mom lives pretty close by and she's been helping um, with our, our young kids. And when she came into the house today, um, you know, she says hello to my daughter and she greets her and says, hi, princess. And my four-year-old says to her, I'm not a princess. <laughs> and she says, I'm a scientist, which um, <laughs> is actually yeah. wonder- is wonderful for daddy on a lot of different levels. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I think probably does reflect a, a kind of healthy kind of social evolution here in the United States where there's been a determination to help girls appreciate the many possibilities that are available to them. Um, but there's a sense in which we can kind of overcorrect in a sense in which we can, we can do. Um, and we did overcorrect is my observation. We did overcorrect 
we uh, emancipated women and we said, yes, you can do all of these things and urge them on, push them on, persuaded them, cajoled mm -hmm. them. Um, but we also, in that process, I think unwittingly, mm -hmm. uh, we emasculated men. Mm -hmm. And perhaps even denigrated women and, who took on more traditional roles in their households. And exactly. I think that, that, exactly. You know, all of those things are worth worth thinking about carefully and Care, you know, very carefully. And and then we, what we've also done, if you look at decades and decades of literature on mm -hmm. the relationship between men and women, is we've create we've made that relationship so hostile and so toxic. And we now have a generation, Gen Z, and maybe the lower, the younger millennials who are completely confused. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I think it's worth it to revisit these things. And something that started for me as a simple question after the George Floyd event of, okay, so we all have to wake up to reality. We have an enormous community um, of our citizens who, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. face um, some of the challenges I've only seen in very poor African countries. Mm. And we are the richest, most powerful country. So this should be something we can resolve. That's right. That's sort of how the question started out for me. And I started to pursue the answers to that and the, the reading I did and the conversations I had with people about, I think it's, I think it's easy to close these gaps. But the more I get into it, the more I think it's not really only the black community that's in a crisis with mm -hmm. this big crisis. And if they have an identity crisis, you will see the white man has an even bigger identity crisis. Yeah. Um, black women have an identity crisis, but white women have an even identity, even a bigger one and so on. And so I think maybe it's time to revisit some of these uh, that's, I'm running out of time, but I wanted to close with, um, this is what I would like to think um, more about, give more thoughts, uh, talk to young men like you uh, and, for, and from the other communities and maybe figure out a way of, uh, like you said, addressing it sensitively, uh, thoughtfully, mm -hmm. We don't want to exclude or, or insult or, or hurt people's feelings or offend mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but we need to give this some serious thought in the most civil way possible. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I want to thank you for, for just including me in this conversation today. It's, it's, it's wonderful to be able to have kind of a healthy and kind of curious and probing exchange of ideas and to do it in a context where... You don't have to worry that you'll be <laughs> misconstrued or that someone will latch on to, you know, something said in a way that's perhaps a little less elegant, um, where kind of the best, the best intentions can be presumed, uh, presumed. And I just, I wish there were more spaces like that um, in our polity today. And unfortunately, it just feels like those, those are in short supply. Although I do think that maybe things are changing for the better these days, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I'm at least optimistic. And I'm optimistic too. And I think maybe a part of it all is let's just start doing it. Let's yes. have the conversations and we can demonstrate that they can be civil and polite. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't think today anyone who listens to our conversation is going to accuse either one of us. Well, I did call governor. <laughs> I think I think uh, the rules are different for politicians. <laughs> like you have a record yeah. and, and it gets you that, into trouble. That was or, impolite. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that, uh, and not civil, but other than that, I would say if you, if you really listen to this conversation, you would not shy away. Uh, you would not accuse us of being uncivil. I'd say that's right. Yeah. Uh, but I'm very curious how we answer those questions. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm, I look forward to perhaps talking about that another time. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. And good luck with everything. And good luck. And thank you for everything you do. Oh, well, thank you so much, Ian. I really appreciate your time and thank you for doing this. Thank you for turning in to this episode. As always, if you're enjoying this podcast, consider supporting it at ianhirsiali.com. 
Thank you and until next time.